This is one of our talks on the VR track we're having this year. John Nelson will be presenting on Oculus Go. My name is Steve Sheets. Um, please um, ask questions during the conference, uh, during the panel. We will have another panel um, an hour after this on AR kit for the iOS. Following up in this afternoon, we'll be having one on um, AR and VR in museums by two experts in the area. And then tomorrow morning, we'll have our panel talk on programming all levels of, of VR, AR. So if you have any questions about wanting to get into Pratt, we have a, a group of panelists who, from a wide range of devices. I'm actually surprised how much we have. So, John, please take it. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, and I want to thank Steve for arranging a lot of these talks. He's uh, arranged this uh, new VR track, and uh, it's hopefully going to be uh, 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 soon a showcase for uh, MAGFest. So my talk, uh, I'm John Nelson. Uh, my talk is uh, entitled Building Your First VR Game for Oculus Go. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I've been in the industry for uh, well, almost 40 years. And uh, I have a number of interests, game design, uh, AI, uh, VR and AR, and I have experience in, uh, in, in these uh, as well. Um, the outline of the presentation, we're going to really focus on design of your first game. Design and less the mechanics and implementation, but more the design and the philosophy of building a game for Oculus. Because it is more a matter of, uh, or it's less a matter of uh, slapping a bunch of cameras on a first person shooter. Uh, it's, uh, it takes some uh, 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 unique uh, design skills to. Um, to uh, build a uh, VR app for uh, Oculus, uh, considering the constraints that uh, the hardware brings to you. Uh, we're going to talk about prototyping. We're going to talk about stories. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, deployment and uh, building for, with uh, the Unity 3D engine. Um, but we're going to talk about design and uh, the Oculus uh, constraints as well. So Oculus Go is brand new. It was released in May of this year or actually last year, uh, 2018. And uh, it's uh, really a great platform. I've brought, I've brought my Oculus here. Uh, it's uh, completely self-contained. There's no tethers, uh, no uh, external computers to use. Uh, it's a standard headset, uh, really good optics, uh, decent frame rate. It's not the best frame rate in the world. You, for a VR game, you probably want 120 frames per second, but uh, 90 is acceptable. And, Oculus doesn't quite make it to 90. It goes to 60 or 75 in a special uh, super mode. Um, it has built-in audio speakers. The uh, audio is built into the straps of the headset, and it uh, supports surround sound, uh, 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 3D sound, spatial, spatial contouring. Um, it is, however, only three degrees of freedom, which means that uh, you get uh, pitch, yaw, and roll. You can look up and look to the side and look down. And, but you can't move the camera laterally. You can't go forward, backward, or uh, it doesn't have sensors for that. You, you can in, in game, you can, uh, you can uh, simulate walking, but uh, it doesn't respond, the hardware doesn't sense your movements in a lateral sense. Uh, 95 degrees freedom of uh, uh, field of view is pretty good. Uh, the human eye has 180, approximately 180 degrees of freedom uh, field of view. Uh, so 95 is not bad. Um, it has Wi-Fi. It has an app store. Uh, it's a really beautifully thought out consumer uh, consumer package, uh, and it comes with a single controller. Let me hold up the controller. This haptic. Uh, single trigger, just a couple other function buttons. Uh, it's a really simple, really thought out, well thought out device. Um, and that's a picture of me with my Oculus. Uh, I, I purchased this in October and I've been developing since then, so I only have about three months worth of development experience under my belt, but I've learned a lot. So uh, I'm, I'm still just a newbie. On the greater scale of things, uh, the, the equipment we're going to need to uh, develop for the Oculus Go, um, an Oculus Go, for, first off, which has a Qualcomm Snapdragon 821 processor in it. That's uh, basically an Android cell phone processor. 
Um, but it works very well. Uh, it's a, uh, we need Android Studio, uh, C Sharp, uh, which is uh, included with the Mono Develop system, the Java Development Kit, JDK, and, uh, and uh, now uh, Visual Studio has become the default IDE instead of Mono, so uh, you might be a, want to be aware of that. Um, we're going to also need a package called the Android Debug Bridge, the ADB, which is, facilitates side loading of the app from Unity into the uh, Oculus uh, device, and, uh, and of course the Unity 3D editor. But before we get into development, I want to talk about best practices. What is VR? You know, we talk a lot about VR, but what, what is it really? Some people like to refer to it as immersion, you know, immersing yourself in, in, into a space, into a media, into a virtual space. Uh, others like to think of it as presence, the, the presence of you in that space. But however, however you want to uh, define it, um, uh, it boils down to a, a first-person first uh, view of, of a world that's created around you. Um, with the Oculus Go, we only have three degrees of freedom, so uh, you're basically stationary in that world, unless you implement some kind of movement controls. Uh, and uh, um, the information that's presented to you is immediate as opposed to perfect. And what I mean by that is in, in game theory, there's, there are things called perfect games, where all the information is available to the player or players in the game. In a third-person mode, a God mode, you have all the information of the game available to you because you're God and you're looking down on it. Whereas in a first-person shooter or first-person mode, you have only immediate information. You only are aware of the information that's around you. And uh, this is good for game design because uh, it allows for exploration and local cues and uh, various other uh, uh, information that you don't necessarily want to have revealed immediately. So keep that in mind when we start talking about design. So in best practices, uh, things that you don't want to do um, in, uh, in VR mode, and I know Steve is really... Uh, number one rule. He's the number one rule is, and please... Number one rule, do not make your customers sick. It's a bad idea. Yeah. And it surprisingly occurs a lot. It does occur a lot. I, I'm a veteran first-person shooter gamer, you know, when I heard that uh, VR created nausea, I was like, oh, come on, you know, I'm, I'm used to the head bob, and, you know, I, I, I don't get sick. I'm, I'm, I'm a solid space trooper, you know, I, I, I don't uh, get nausea, nauseated. But let me tell you, when I got on the Oculus Go and started playing Temple Run, Man, I was really feeling queasy because because Temple Run is is a is a narrow corridor, fast motion running game, and uh, and there's a lot of motion and a lot a lot of uh, things running by your side, and that is apparently the, the prime thing that's going to make you sick. Um, Statistically, the numbers are about 10 to 15 percent of everyone has a little bit of a problem with VR. It's about the same numbers that occur with going to watch 3D. Uh, movies. There's another 10 to 15 percent of people who they think are okay with VR, but really can't handle the motion of high motion movement. They're the ones who get sick on the roller coaster or, like he said, Temple Run. And a lot of times they don't know it. Some of us suspect the numbers are closer to 30 percent. So this is a large percentage of your customer base. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I would not be surprised if it was uh, if the, if those numbers were any greater. Um, another rule, you don't use mood music. Now, Doom, if you remember Doom and Quake and, and all of these games, uh, featured soundtracks, the full soundtracks, and to set the mood of, you know, the space trooper, you know, da 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 you know, that kind of stuff. Um, in VR, th that's exactly what you don't want to do, because in a virtual world or in the real world, you don't have a soundtrack running. You have maybe ambient noise and ambient uh, sound, but you don't have a soundtrack, and that detracts really from the immersion experience. Uh, you don't want to have didactic uh, tools like arrows and text and things, things pointing you know, in, in to doors saying, go through this door, you know, talk to the innkeeper, you know. 
there seems to be a, a, a pile of loot under this rock, you know. That, that's absolutely what you don't want because in the real world, you don't have pop-up menus and pop-up arrows and text uh, uh, telling you to, you need to check out now, you know. You need to pay your bill. Well, sometimes you do. But um, you, you don't want to have artifacts, computer artifacts, that are outside the metaphor of the game Intrusing, intrusive, intrusive, intrusively interacting with you in the game. Uh, you don't want unnatural instrumentation, so uh, if you're going to walk forward, walk backward, you probably don't want to use a controller because in the real world you don't use a controller to walk, you use your feet. And that's one of the problems with the Three Degrees of Freedom devices is that you are stationary, you don't have the ability to walk in room space. You, you have to um, interact with the virtual world in a stationary position. So uh, a natural instrumentation like, uh, like joysticks and uh, mice and stuff like that are pretty much uh, not good. And that will contribute to motion sickness too because if your brain senses that you're moving via your eyes, you know, if you see the scene moving but your feet are not moving, then the brain interprets that as something really desperately wrong and you will get nauseated. Um, don't overuse the third person view. In other words, uh, that God mode, don't, don't do that. Uh, dinosaurs at your back. Uh, you don't want to have to force your, your player to twist around and look behind him and, and, and crane his neck because uh, the only thing that's going to result from that is uh, spinal injuries. Uh, you want most of the action to be in front, within the field of view. And uh, something else that um, uh, some games do is there's no up. The human mind wants to see a horizon. We need a stable horizon and a sense of up. And uh, if, you, if your game doesn't do that, then, then you have a, a good chance of freaking, freaking the brain out. Um, never let the game take control of the camera. This, this is, this is, a, this is a, a human guidelines, human interface guidelines uh, rule as well for, for any uh, computer, and that is the computer never changes the interface, or it shouldn't. And I know there are a lot of websites and a lot of applications that violate this, but this was a, an Apple, Apple computer or human guideline uh, for many years uh, back in the day. Um, when they, when they first uh, 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 refined the uh, mouse-driven interface. Uh, you don't want that computer taking control out of the hands of the user because your brain is going to freak out. It's going to be like, well, the scene is changing. Things are changing. Stuff is happening, and I'm not doing it. Um, things that are good are smooth and realistic motion, teleporting for... Mo for you don't want to get that temple run uh, uh, nausea problem. So one of the ways around that is teleporting. We're going to see a little bit about that later. Uh, first person view is good because if you're in a virtual world, you are in presence in that world. So um, your first person view is important. Uh, you want good resolution, 1080p or better, and 60 frames per second or better, 90 if you can, if you can manage it. The Oculus Go, uh, even though it maxes out at 75 uh, frames per second, you can use the, uh, the uh, debugging tool, the ADB, to uh, amp up the resolution and, uh, and some of the frame rate um, into the uh, hyper mode. Um, realistic audio. Always make sure your audio cues are appropriate. The, um, one of the things about movies is that uh, the, uh, the audience will forgive bad visuals, but they will never forgive bad audio. Bad audio is, is direct into the brain, and, uh, and uh, so you want your audio to always be realistic. It provides cues, and it provides uh, a lot of information uh, for the virtual environment. Uh, one way to, uh, to convey information to your, uh, to your player is via audio cues, like there's a growling sound behind you, or the sniper who's shooting you, you know, via 3D spatial sound, you can kind of pinpoint, oh, he's up there, or he's behind me, or something like that. Um, in the virtual world, we don't use text and arrows and, you know, the diactic uh, 
uh, cues, but you should use um, breadcrumbs. Leave, leave clues behind. Instead of blatantly throwing information in, in your player's uh, uh, face, you should leave breadcrumbs. Uh, little cues and little little hints that something is happening or something uh, is can be found somewhere. Um, uh, let the let the player progressively learn about the environment as opposed to being uh, uh, hit in in the face with uh, with uh, information. You want freedom to explore. Uh, or as I like to say, virtual reality is like exploring a country meadow under a sunny blue sky. It's not an afternoon at the DMV. It should, be, it should be a compelling and engaging world, you know, something you want to explore and you want to learn about, not something that you're having information thrown at you and slapped in your face. And that's why you don't want to have the uh, soundtrack music and the text and, you know, all these, all these artifacts that are not virtual. Uh, so the Unity 3D Editor is the uh, tool that we're going to use to uh, do our modeling and, uh, and to build the application for the Oculus Go. And uh, you can read this. It's a screen-based screen model editor, uh, scriptable via C Sharp. C Sharp is a computer language that uh, is very Java-like. Uh, we're going to use the Mono Develop or Visual Studio platform. I like Mono Develop just because it's free. Um, I also use Visual Studio. I use Visual Studio. Yep. And Visual Studio is the is now the default for Unity 3D. They used to use Mono Develop, but uh, they've switched over to Visual Studio as their default platform. So I, I guess that that says you should use it. Um, one of the beauties of Unity, and one of the reasons it's very popular is that it supports cross-platform build targets. So that means that you can build for Xbox, for PC, for Mac, for, for iPad, all kinds of platforms. And I really like this, because if I'm going to build a game, I want to deploy to every platform I possibly can. But the problem is that we're building for the VR world. We're building for Oculus Go. So um, all of those flat panel platforms are pretty much out. Um, but that's okay because we could have a VR version or we could have a PC version or uh, whatever. Um, Unity 3D sports an asset store, which is great because you can get all kinds of free stuff, prefabs and packages. We'll, I'll talk about a little bit about that later. But all the content for your game, a lot of it can be obtained for free, and that, that's how I built the prototype game that I'm going to show you. There are several commercial games on the market are completely and utterly made with free artwork. They didn't hire a single artist to do it. But you have to be aware of the licensing restrictions. Yes. They, they sometimes come with typically good licensing, uh, but um, not, nothing onerous. And the licensing for Unity 3D created applications does come with some licensing, but you have to be making a lot of money and deploying a lot of uh, seats for the, for the game to, uh, to trip over those. Um, the uh, prepping for the uh, for the app build, uh, where you're going to have to download and import uh, the standard assets for Unity 3D, the Oculus SDK, and and then finally your game content. I know this is a lot of a little sketchy, and the, the reason why is because if if I was going to talk about all the full mechanics of using Unity and developing Unity and Oculus, it would take hours. It's really a, it's a complex development uh, uh, topic, so I'm just going to give you little little hints uh, and little breadcrumbs and uh, and assign you homework at the end of this, uh, this talk. This is a screen snap of the Unity workspace. Uh, I've put together just a small room, and this took me no more than half an hour to, to construct. Uh, it's made up of walls that are uh, rectangular objects. Uh, you can see there's a robot character in the middle. The floor is, has some reflectance to it. It's colored purple, and it has uh, some reflectance, so it's reflecting the sky above. So it has a sky box as well. And there are three cubes uh, floating in three space, uh, which uh, are textured with the texture atlas that's, uh, that's being used by the robots. So uh, I, I thought I'd give it a kind of a tech texture. The cubes are floating in space because I haven't turned on gravity yet. And you, there is a sense of gravity, and so there's a sense of up. Uh, the plane of the room provides a horizon. And uh, so it, it's a very natural looking uh, kind of scene. 
except that we're using the main camera because we want to view our project. Uh, we don't necessarily want to be in first person mode uh, as we're constructing the project, so we're using the uh, third person main camera. Uh, you can see that uh, if, uh, well, if you can see that on the screen, the, the, there are basically four major panels here. Uh, there's the scene viewer, the game viewer. The game is the running game. That's the bottom panel. The scene is the, uh, is the main camera construction scene. That, that's at the top left. The project on the bottom right is where you have all of your imported assets, your prefabs, your packages, and all that kind of stuff. And the hierarchy is the is the modeling, the construction of you're taking the prefabs and the uh, and the content of the packages you've imported from the asset store, you're dragging them up into the hierarchy view and and assembling them there to uh, create a scene, which is then uh, run as the game. Uh, Unity Asset Store. Unity Asset Store is a really great resource. Um, so you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You just want to take advantage of the free stuff. And uh, they have lots of game samples, code examples, uh, tutorials, source code. Uh, there's uh, tons of free Unity downloads, props, terrain, uh, scenes. Uh, and and it, it comes with excellent licensing terms, too, when you deploy your game. So we'll, I'll, I'll give you a list of resources that you can access, but it's, uh, the asset store is really great. And this is one reason why Unity is doing so well and is so popular is because uh, there's so much free stuff. This is, the, uh, this is one of the uh, assets that I'm using in the prototype game. It's called Cartoon Temple uh, Building Kit Light, and uh, it's, it's a really fabulous uh, uh, set of uh, temple levels and walls and, and construction uh, uh, objects uh, to build a, uh, a, a temple environment. And uh, it, it, as you can see, it's free. And all I did was click on the import button and it imported uh, all of this stuff into Unity. Um, there's going to be an iterative process to assembling these things. We're going to create game objects, add components, um, customize the components with property sheets. That's basically parameterizing the componentry. And uh, dragging uh, your prefabs and, uh, and the scripts into the hierarchy to assemble the, the scene. So here we have uh, a very simple scene constructed with the standard assets. And I'm going to run this, this game scene. And you can see at the bottom I have two figures, and I'm controlling that one figure, and I drop him off the cliff. And this is one reason why you always want to play, uh, play test your scenes in Unity, uh, because you want to make sure that you uh, haven't, haven't got a problem in your code. And he's going to do the right thing now, because I discovered what the problem was, and it was the way I was navigating, and so now I can walk him around. And all the rigging, all the modeling, all the texture mapping, although there is no texture, really. There's a material, which is uh, just a, a flat matte material. Uh, all of this is uh, free. It, this, these are the, uh, some of the standard enemies and standard characters of the Unity Asset Store. Wow, that was... Okay, so what we're going to do now, since we were kind of aware of what we're going to have to do with Unity and how to edit and uh, using the asset store and stuff, we're going to prototype our game. We're going to get ideas. So we'll start with the Rollerball tutorial in Unity. And um, um, this, is, this is one of the, uh, here we go. You can see the, uh, the, little, the little cubes are rotating, and the, the center sphere is, uh, is the player. And the object of the game is to roll the, the ball. I'm really not very good at this game. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry about that. My fast twitch muscles are too twitchy. OK. So the player, 
that is to say the sphere, is just going to roll over the cubes and pick them up. And it picks them up by just rolling over them. And this is a fun little game in a God mode, in third person mode. But the question is, is this going to work in VR mode? And the conclusion is actually no. Okay. I get, think you get the idea. Why would we want this in VR? Well, we really wouldn't, because there's, God mode is not VR. There's no immersion, there's no exploration or discovery, and there's all, all the all perfect information. So this is not appropriate for VR. It's a great example for using Unity in a flat panel, like a PC, but it really has nothing to do with VR. So let's, let's look at another prototype, the robot factory. So what we're gonna do is construct a maze, very similar to the, to the robot you know, little room that I built before with maze walls and put the player in the center. And let's, let's see if this one's got a movie. No, oh, this doesn't have a movie. So, so why would we want to do this? Well, the chase camera behind the player does improve the presence because you're, you're in the scene. But the problem is third person view is not VR and uh, there's that risk of motion sickness from movement. So let's try another prototype. Uh, recognizing that motion is not a good thing, we're gonna place our player in a um, stationary position next to a turret gun. And uh, we're, I've constructed a crypt, like a little uh, 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 cemetery crypt off in the distance. And uh, there's zombies coming out of the crypt. And let's run this. And so the turret gun is trying to kill the zombies. Well, they're already dead, so. And the zombies just keep on going and going and going until they get to the player, and they, they, they do their zombie victory dance at the bottom. Zombies are very popular. Yeah. There are tons of zombie games. <laughs> they make great enemies because, you know, you can, you can wail on them and not feel guilty because they're zombies, you know? <laughs> They're also actually easy to animate. You don't have to have exact details. And there's a large range of ones for cartoon looking to more realistic ones. So, uh, and you'll notice at the top, all, all of these rigged figures start with their, hand, their arms out. This is the standard rigged figure position. Uh, all, all rigged figures start, start off like that. And we'll do this one more time. So the zombies come out of the crypt. Notice that they're navigating on their own. Uh, that's because there's a thing called a nav mesh, which uh, enables an AI uh, navigation, uh, pre-baked navigation routine to, uh, to guide them on their way, because the terrain is fixed, so uh, Unity knows ahead of time. Okay. You can actually get emergent behavior from this, which means that the zombies will do things you are not expecting. That's, that's and which the, is beautiful. You can, as a developer, of something happens you did not expect and it works out great. So I conclude that this is a big yawn as well. The stationary view avoids motion sickness and the zombies introduce a challenge, but there's no exploitation of the space. You're sitting there in a fixed, fixed location and there's no really compelling reason for VR in this one. You, you get a little bit of the, the VR uh, the depth of the space, but not really. So let's, let's try another prototype. Here's one I call Rogue Ro Robots, which consists of three rooms linked by corridors, and you have a player in one of the rooms. He starts out in the standard rigged position. He turns on, and you notice the light that's guiding, he doesn't want to go that way, so the light guides him to this door. The door opens, he walks down the corridor, and then there's robots, enemy robots in there. So, oh, I gotta run through this door. Run down the corridor through this door. And then, well, I've reached the end of that corridor. I don't know where to go. Oh, I guess I go this way. Go through this door. 
and I reach some kind of goal. There's a, there's a patrolling robot in here, and I guess I have to defeat him. Oh, there's a bunch of robots in here, so I guess I need to defeat them all in order to obtain my goal. But you know what? I, I didn't continue with this prototype because um, it's better. It's better in a, it's, it has better immersion. It exploits the space. That moving light drives the player. It's a cue that says, you're supposed to go this way. Follow me. Um, the doors throttle the motion, so it, the, the doors help to limit the motion sickness. And they also offer uh, a dice, uh, partitioning of the space so that you have room after room after room, so you can have challenge after challenge after challenge. So the doors compartmentalize the space, and, uh, and the enemies, the ro rogue robots, uh, offer a challenge. But the problem is that chase camera is still not VR, and the long hallways will probably induce motion sickness. It's just not immersive enough. It's better, but it's just not immersive. So I downloaded and constructed this, this uh, temple room, this uh, uh, cartoony temple room, uh, from that free asset, the Temple uh, Temple Adventure uh, or Temple Cartoon Temple Kit, and uh, navigated my player through this, and this looks a lot better. And here's a movie of the uh, Temple Room. This is very immersive. It's in first-person shooter mode, or uh, God, or uh, first-person mode. It's very ambient. There's plenty of toys to play with, you know, there's stuff to explore. There's still a little, there's still a little danger of motion sickness, but, you know, if you keep the motion down and the walking down, that's under your control. You can see there's a lot to explore here. This is an engaging environment. It's, it's interesting. It's worth looking at. It's worth exploring. The lighting and the uh, and the the facade are all really, really. Uh, I want to give nice. a caveat here. Um, the screen makes it look much darker than it is in real life. When you're putting the Oculus Go on, you can see the details much better. So uh, I don't want to get the impression. Now, darkness is a mood that some games can do. But that's not what's happening. It's a bad screen. Right. Well, it's not so much a bad screen as the the Oculus is limited, uh, limited resolution, limited uh, color palette, and. Uh, and there are ways to amp that up with the ADB. You can customize that. I'm just saying this, the Oculus looks better than what you see on the projector there. Oh, um, oh I get you. I get you. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that's uh, unfortunately something I can't bring you uh, because I wanted to live cast a lot of this, have a live you know, demo of the Oculus. But um, I can't get the... Uh, live casting to work with this app and the uh, network here at the hotel isn't supporting it anyway. So, so we've taken a look at this new space and, and I say score because uh, the first person view is VR. It's a visually compelling space. There are toys to play with. There are things to explore. And who doesn't love a dungeon adventure, you know? But Movement is still a problem. The interface is clumsy. The, that player, you know, the way he's walking through there and hobbling over those blocks, he can get stuck. Um, there's the Dalek syndrome where you can't walk up stairways. Uh, uh, you can't get to upper platforms. Um, changes in direction can be jarring. You know, you're walking along and then you, you rotate and turn and, you know, and there's, there's, there's motion jarring. and. Uh, and we need to avoid the motion within cramped spaces. We don't want that temple run, uh, uh, narrow corridor, zooming bias and creating nausea. So the solution is teleporting. And teleporting is uh, the ability to click on a controller or use some kind of gaze semantics or, or some such control to just simply teleport to a new location. So there's no... no um, there's no sens sensation of, of motion. It's you're just in a new scene. And if you think about movies, movies don't usually show actors uh, 
moving, you know, they're only r rare movies that uh, are art films that, you know, will have like a first person mode, except maybe the Doom movie. I wouldn't say that's an art film, but if you remember the Doom movie, it, it followed con conventional movie semantics until they popped into first person shooter mode. And I tell you, the audience I watched that movie with just roared with approval when they went to first-person shooter mode because <laughs> they all recognized that was the doom, the doom uh, metaphor. But um, um, if you are uh, teleporting, uh, you get to obviate that uh, that uh, that sense of motion, and it's in a movie. You usually have a a, per, a, a viewpoint of the camera. The camera is like a, somebody else hovering in the scene, but it rarely moves. It's usually, you know, point of view, point of view, behind somebody's shoulder, behind another person's shoulder, you know, that kind of stuff. There's, there's usually not a lot of motion, um, except in an action adventure film. Uh, and that, in that case, you're interested in the action, not, not, the, uh, not the, the actors. So um, teleporting also encourages exploration. It's a simple user interface. It's a forward motion. There's no backward teleporting because you want to know where you're going. There's a psychological cue because if you're teleporting, you, you have a, a marker that you're teleporting to. So psychologically, the brain sees, oh, I'm going to that marker. So it's, you're preparing, preparing the brain for motion. And then, and you can also jump onto platforms and over obstacles. So teleporting is a really great thing. The homily here is designing for virtual reality. It's not just plugging two cameras into a first-person shooter. And that's very, very true. VR is a totally different metaphor from what you're used to. Uh, really briefly, we're, we're ready to talk about story. We've got the idiom. We've got the, the, the facade of, uh, of our game. And now we're going to talk about the story. Um, and uh, so I, I've got, I've collected all these ideas from the prototypes that I've built, and I've, I've decided what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to create a lost temple, uh, dungeony lost temple uh, crawler. And uh, the story is the player teleports into a lost temple. The only escape is to teleport out. So you're you're stuck in this temple. So there's your challenge: is to escape the temple. You have to. You have to uh, accomplish some kind of uh, uh, challenge. And uh, the challenge is that um, there are power-ups, uh, pickups, that are scattered throughout the temple um, uh, level. And you have to pick up 12 of them in order to teleport out, to gather enough power to teleport out. Now, there's clues along the way as to how these uh, how these uh, power-ups should be used. And, uh, and if you step into the void, you lose the game. So uh, this is a very simple set of rules. And the mechanics uh, are correspondingly simple. Basically, you use teleportation to teleport locally around the temple level and uh, pick up power-ups. There's a script that will count the number of power-ups you've picked up. And when you hit the 12th power-up, uh, you get the chance to escape the temple. Uh, the temple has no floor, so uh, you can walk off the cliff. Remember the, uh, the, uh, the rigged figure that I walked off the, the, the cliff into the void? That's the same sort of thing we're going to use here uh, as, a losing, as the losing. So, so what we have is we have a number of game objects and, uh, and uh, a framework for, for, for playing the, the game. We have a temple, we've got uh, objects, we've got a goal, we've got challenges. They're light, but, uh, and, but uh, it also facilitates exploration. And as I like to say, a game is a toy with a story, a player, and a goal. Games are not toys, or toys are not games, but a toy with a story, and a player, and a goal, and challenges is a game. So let's build it. I've already talked a little bit about um, Unity 3D, and, and basically it's, it's a hierarchy of objects that, that are drag and drop from, uh, from uh, the asset store. So phase one is uh, we're going to use an iterative development process. 
iter iterating over various phases of the uh, of the construction of this thing. We're going to always. Uh, Well, we're going to import our, our, the initial iteration is going to import the te temple package and the Oculus integration package, because we are developing for Oculus, so we want to uh, import the, uh, the Oculus hooks that will turn this into an Oculus game. Uh, we're going to drag the uh, temple scene into the hierarchy, replace the camera, the main camera that, that is used with Unity for flat panel games, uh, we're going to uh, replace with the, uh, the Oculus VR player and camera rig. So we're going to have a first person, sh first person view camera and character rigging, which brings along with it navigation. Uh, we're going to add um, uh, mesh colliders, and th these are things that uh, give rigidity and, uh, and uh, substance to the, uh, to the temple. Um, to the temple walls, because normally that that te those temple models are uh, uh, immaterial. You can walk through them, so they're they're just visual. So what you need to do is add uh, rigid body and mesh uh, uh, collider objects, which keep you prevent you from walking through them. Uh, always log your changes with each iteration. Always log in, in just a little notepad. Um, everything that you did, because if you make a mistake and it's filling out those property sheets with numbers, uh, you may not remember what, what you, where you started, and so you're, you're hanging out in the wind. So always log your changes, save the scenes, save the game project, um, and then play test with that play button. Uh, you, can, you can test with the PC, with your, uh, in PC mode as well. You can build for, for the current PC platform that you're working in. But um, uh, I find this to be optional because you're, you're going to be using the Oculus VR camera rig pretty soon. So, uh, And this is the temple scene. This is, this is the free temple scene that I dragged over from the... Uh, from the package I downloaded, and you can see it's a it's a really nice looking uh, facade. It's got really good lighting. It's got texture. It's got these stone blocks. So this is good. And I've I've already embedded the OVR the uh, Oculus VR camera rig. So we're doing Oculus um, we're doing Oculus uh, viewing of the model right off the bat. I've turned off and disabled the main camera because, you know, pretty pretty soon that main camera is going to be useless to us. There's uh, there's tracking space controllers. There's uh, uh, the old graph scene. I've disabled that because uh, uh, we don't need it anymore. And then play test. Let's see. Is this a movie? Build and test for Mac. There we go. By the way, this is one of the very few VR systems around that you can develop and completely program it on the Mac. So for us Mac developers, we kind of like that. So what I've done is I've pulled down the build panel. I've switched from Android, which is the Oculus uh, hardware, to PC and Mac because I'm going to create a, a, a PC Mac build. Um, It builds, or it uh, actually it, it's changed the player settings to the PC Mac. I use a Mac, but uh, PCs are good as well. Are you doing a video right here, or you're actually building it? Uh, it's actually build. Uh, it's uh, doing a video. Okay. All of this is recorded video um, because of uh, time constraints on this talk. So it's still building. It does sometimes take a while to build. And one of the reasons why is because uh, with advanced lighting schemes, um, Unity is going to pre-bake your lighting and uh, a number of other aspects. So we've, uh, we're creating a build a temple scene for the PC or for the Mac. And it builds. Can you 
just skip ahead with the video. Yeah, it's this way. Okay. So I'm not going to go into detail on this entire process because, um, like I say, it would be two hours at least. But I will give you a list of resources for how to do all these things. Okay, so it builds and your build appears in the uh, in the finder or ex internet file explorer. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. Okay. You have to forgive me for a second there. Oh, there we go. Wait a minute. No. Okay. So what we're going to do now is uh, build for Oculus. Build for Oculus is basically the same thing. Build settings. I'm going to look at the player settings. They're all good. And then we're going to build for Oculus. And it's the same process. You just click the build button and you extrude the build for Oculus. And it rolls along. Oculus can take some time. I mean, this is actually compressed video. I've had builds that have run like three or four minutes. And you're notified that the build succeeded. And you have now a file, an APK file, which is the Oculus binary that you're going to sideload into the Oculus. This is the uh, terminal, and side loading is done with the ADB tools, which uh, which you uh, have installed, and um, and you do it from a terminal window. So uh, here's my machine, Cytosine, uh, and uh, you use the ADB tool to probe the Oculus, which is connected up via USB cable. You can see the Oculus here, and normally I'd have a USB cable connected to the Mac, and. Uh, it, it probes the, the devices that are connected and it lists one device. And uh, this device is uh, my Oculus. So I'm going to install the Temple Scene uh, APK file, which is an Android, uh, an Android binary, executable binary, and, uh, and it succeeds. That usually doesn't take more than 15, sec 15 seconds. And then we're going to test on the Oculus. And this is a video recording of that initial temple scene on the Oculus. And you can see we have navigation because I have the Oculus controller and I'm using the Oculus controller to do uh, very simple navigation through this temple scene. But the scene is pretty boring. Uh, the lighting is okay, but uh, the skybox is kind of generic. You have ground below and sky above. The navigation is kind of boring because uh, we're just using simple movement. It's slow enough that it probably won't make you nauseous, but it might. Because there's that detachment from your feet, which are not moving, and the motion, which is moving. It's kind of smooth and deliberate motion, but you know what? Uh, it's a bit of a snoozer. Okay. So phase two is going to be to install teleporting. And uh, so what I've done here, here's, the, here's an image of the teleporting scene. And you can see that there's a no controller found panel stuck in there. And that's because I've installed the Arc Teleport package, which I downloaded for free from the asset store. And what it does is it creates a teleporting target and parabolic raycaster, which just means it's going to draw a, par a parabolic line to the target that's in front of you where you want to teleport. 
and this is the uh, this is the inspector uh, view of that uh, of that uh, arc parabolic arc. And now we're going to test. We go through the iterative uh, iterative process. We install the uh, the arc teleporter package, save, log our changes, and this is the teleport arc with the being controlled by the Oculus controller. And you can see now we've got targets. The brain is being set up. Oh, I'm going to move to that target. Click, teleport there. There's a target, click. Target, click. Target, click. Target, click. So you're being set up, your brain is being set up to, now, so, you know, it's, it's a little jarring, but, uh, but for long distances, it's like switching scenes in a movie. Oh, I'm in this scene now. Oh, I'm, I'm at this point of view now. And here's a big benefit. You can arc teleport up on top of obstacles. So I just teleported on top of that big block. I, I, can, I can go, I can span that gulf. You know, I can hop over uh, valleys. And you can see the target, you can change the target the direction of the player's view at the target. So I can face the hallways. I can te teleport down this pathway. I can look around and gaze at things. I don't have to be so intent on motion. I, I have freedom to look around and enjoy the scenery. All right, so phase three is going to be to introduce our, te our uh, teleport pickups. Remember, we're going to, um, we're, we, we, we're going to have power-ups to uh, enable us to gain enough power to teleport out of there. Now, take a look at these pickups. They should look familiar. This is the rollerball set of pickups. Uh, imported from the rollerball demo uh, into, uh, into our scene. So a lot of this stuff is very portable and component-based. Uh, so here's our object hierarchy. We've installed 12 pickups. Uh, the score is being, which is another one of our objects, conceptual objects, the score is being kept by the uh, by the uh, by script, which uh, uh, is a container for the scoring. Each time we pick up one of the pickups, one of the power-ups, uh, it counts one in the score, and the score is going to be displayed by canvas object. Canvas object is just an overlay uh, object which contains text. Now I know I said that you don't want artifacts like that in your game, but you know, frankly. I just needed to get by with uh, as simple as I could get by with. Um, part of your homework would be to convert this from counting and displaying a number to maybe an icon-based uh, scoring or maybe a wristwatch that shows your, your power level or something in a more intuitive fashion. This, this is a very simple score script which um, keeps the score and uh, I won't go through the, really all the details but basically what this is doing is every time you you walk on a power-up, it hits a trigger which um, destroys the power-up but counts the score. So they disappear every time you walk over them and, uh, and counts the score. A lot of the rules that John was giving you, you need to know the rules so you know when is the right time to break them. So you know that, yes, we want to have a nice, tranquil setting. Okay, now that we understand how to do that, I'm making a horror app and it will have more bad lighting and horror aspects of it. But you can't do that until you know how to write a good one. And uh, you learn these things as you play the game. That's the beauty of, of some games is that the, the learning is, is progressive. And uh, there's discovery and, and cues, and, and so you, rule, you learn the rules as you go instead of being prompted to do things. Um, we're going to add some polish now to this. We're going to add a moody skybox because I'm, I'm a big fan. Because our temple 
has void underneath it and sky above it. So I figured, well, it's a sky temple. It's floating in the air in some manner so that if you walk off it, you, walk, you, you dump yourself into the void. So we'll add a moody sky box, um, uh, some additional walls to keep you from walking off into the void, uh, but you want to constrain your, constrain your motion. Um, there's one thing I didn't tell you, and this is something that the player has to learn, is that there's actually, there's 12 pickups, but the 12th pickup has to be picked up last. That's the one that teleports you out of there. So, um, so uh, what you do is you arrange your script to, to detect only the 12th pickup, and what, we, what we're going to do is construct a, sort of a little sanctuary where that 12th pickup resides. But it'll be obvious which one is the 12th pickup because of the visual and audio cues that we'll provide. And we're going to also add some ambient noise, some wind to the, to the corridors. Not music, but noise, because sound is, is, is uh, perfectly realistic. Uh, the pickups should have an audio cue. I didn't have time to put that in there. Uh, and, uh, re and we're going to reposition the score on the canvas so that it's obvious what the score is. And these are the uh, objects that we're adding along with this polished plain mesh, text, canvas. <laughs> and the canvas object has the score text on it. The parabolic object, that's the teleport arc. Coming up on your time. I know. That's why I'm pushing through this <laughs> really quickly. I'm sorry that I'm rushing through all of this because you really need to know the details of um, how this is working. But on the other hand, uh, that's going to be the fun of it. You know, I'm, I'm going to give. In, what is it they say? The uh, exor exercises for the reader. Oh, there's a lot of stories about people tweaking things and making a mistake and having accidentally added a new feature that they kept in the game afterwards. Tons of stories about that, people doing that. So this is, the, this is the, final, the final thing running on the Oculus Go. I wanted to do a live cast with sound, you know, right here live from the Oculus Go. You can do that. You can actually share what you're seeing on the Oculus through a center screen to your mobile device, which has the Oculus app. And, uh, and uh, I could reflect that to the screen. But live casting isn't working for my app. It, it works for most de deployed apps on the asset store, but for mine it isn't. And I think it's because I haven't provisioned the app properly. So I had to make a video recording of the uh, app running on the Oculus in the Oculus itself. You don't get audio, which is a shame because the audio ambience of this app is really, really good. And if you want, you can, I can demo it on the Oculus after this, after this presentation. So here we go. You can see that we have the score on the canvas, and we're teleporting to each of these power-ups. I've changed their color and, uh, and... One of the things that John didn't mention is that teleporting is a common interface for the Oculus. So if you've done one app, other apps will do it. So you really quickly start getting used to using that as a way of moving around. And it's a you, very common. You do get used to it. Uh, I, and you notice how quickly I'm, I'm, I'm moving through these corridors. Once I've picked up these things up, I don't want to have to spend my time maneuvering through these corridors. It gives you the flexibility to go fast or go slow, but, but avoiding nausea. Notice that, we're, that our power is increasing because we're picking up these pickups, five, now six, come on, six, there we go. Down another corridor. Notice I've added some crypt gates to keep you from dumping into the void. Kind of gives it a, a sense of, you know, a castle that's lost in the sky, but it's kind of semi-destroyed. Now notice here, there's power-ups on these platforms. Notice I'm gonna jump right to the edge here and then jump right over that chasm to get to that power up, I'm going to jump up to the top level. You can't do this unless you have a teleporting mechanism. It also limits the range. A person can't teleport where he's not supposed to go. And that's surprisingly useful for some games. That's right. You notice that there are times when this, that arc turns a kind of a light violet color, and that's because it can't be operated. Notice this, I jump up on top of this block. Whoa. 
Got that, got that power up. Now I can jump over that chasm. How many people have had a game where you fell into a crack between somewhere and can't get bowed again? Look at this, I jump up on top of that block, I get a nice sky view. So I'm at power 10, I'm looking around, where's the other, where's the other, I'm looking down this corridor, nope, nope, I picked that one up. Where is that, where is number 11? You can see there's something glowing red over there, that's something different. I'm looking for blue, uh, blue power-ups. I can tell you with confidence this would take days to do in the old days before these tools were available. Absolutely. This took me quite, quite a bit of time to assemble. It's just because I'm learning. I'm, I'm learning. Well, once you learn it, you can do it easily. That's right. Yeah, I can use this game as a, as a template. And really, this is just a technology demo for your purposes. I mean, this is not a full-fledged game. But it looks good. So I'm, I'm at power 11. What about, what, what is this thing down here, this red, this red glowy thing that's in this little sanctuary area? The ambiance of this is really great. I mean, look at this. this the lighting is kind of moody. And oh, here's a red glowy thing with, uh, it looks like a power up. And I'm supposed to pick up 12 of them. So maybe I pick up this one last. Oh, I escaped. So I won the game. OK. Just a note about deployment. We've seen the build settings uh, and the player settings. Um, these are important for Oculus Go because there are, there's a virtual, uh, virtual reality SDK setting that you have to have turned on, which is on the left-hand side. That's just a checkbox. Um, you need to fill out your company name, your, your app name, your, the version of, uh, of um, uh, the, the version of uh, Android that, that you're working against because it is an Android device, and I use uh, version 21, Lollipop. So the company name is computation.com, the Sky Temple is the product name, the package name is that, that reverse URL uh, thing that, ever, that, uh, that uh, uniquely identifies uh, your app, and it has to be uniquely identified uh, if you're gonna put it in the App Store. Uh, the build target is Android, VR support is provided by Oculus, you sideload with ADB one more time. You probe for the devices and then install. Uh, and here is an in Oculus view of launching that app. We go to unknown, unknown sources, browse through the apps that I've installed. These are all apps I developed. Click on them and and what happens is the, the video recording stops. Side loading is just downloading from your Mac or your PC into the Android device. I'm and not we, sure why they call it side loading. Oh, uh, it's because you're not downloading or uploading. You're kind of you're off to the side. You download downloading from the one device to another. Yeah. I've changed the lighting on these crypt gates a little bit. This is the final. The of course, final this isn't the way that your users, if you're going to sell it in the store, would appear. They would just appear as a normal one in the store. He's actually downloading an app that he installed himself. Right, because this is just a technology demo. And, and we're but more just importantly, the tools weren't really designed from Oculus to be real easy, beautiful, pretty in your face. If you do it in the store, you get artwork and you information. Get, you get splash screens. Right. You get, this is a developer's tool. And, and here's, here's building on top of that, that thought. If you really want to deploy this to the App Store, you have to fill out, you have to provision the app. So it means you have to fill out all kinds of information. You need private, public, private key, uh, key pairs, tokens. Uh, it's, it's a little bit involved. But if you're serious about deploying an app instead of just sideloading a toy, you know, that you're building. You've got to give them your ch uh, bank account number if you're going to sell it. Bank account number, uh, a URL for a website. Um, support, you know, contact. But this is pretty standard. This is everything you do if you're doing installing an app in any app store, be it iOS or Windows or Steam. So uh, this is one reason I think why uh, live casting, I can't live cast it, is uh, uh, because it only provisioned and uh, approved apps can be live cast. That's my suspicion. Resources, we're almost through, through so... Uh, um, 
uh, Oculus Sampler Framework. There's a, on Oculus's website, there is a lot of developer tools and, and samples and uh, a framework that you should, you should download. Interestingly enough, when I was constructing this, uh, this, this demo and those prototypes, they changed that framework on me. So I was going to show you other samples, and then they discontinued them. They, they, um, they uh, deprecated them. And so I had to start all over again. So, but uh, the, this uh, sampler framework is included in the Oculus integration package, which you need to, to target Oculus devices. Um, Unity has in-app tutorials, a learn, a, a, a learn set of tutorials, which you can access in the application itself. And uh, these are really good. We will be debating Unity versus Unreal tomorrow at, at 10 o'clock session. But one of the biggest advantages of Unity is the tutorials and the community. And the simplicity. I and think the, simplicity. the learning curve is much steeper for uh, Unreal. Uh, the Unity Rollerball tutorial, this is really a so simple a tutorial. It wasn't really applicable to Oculus Go development, but it's, uh, it's really, it, it'll get you up to speed on, uh, on Unity. And there's the Unity standard asset samples. Uh, which are included in the standard assets package. It includes a, a number of fun little games that demonstrate physics and stuff. There's something really advanced called the first-person shooter sample. And this requires the, one of the beta uh, versions of Unity. Unity uh, has alpha and beta versions that you can download, but also, uh, which you'll probably want to use uh, for mundane development is the LTS version, the uh, long-term support version. Um, explore Unity's uh, website, you'll, you'll learn about all this kind of stuff. But this looks compelling, this, uh, this uh, FPS sample. Other resources, uh, Ud Udemy or Udemy, uh, however you pronounce it, which is an education site. Uh, that, um, that is... Uh, uh, a really good site for uh, tutorials. Uh, YouTube and Ray Wenderlich are good, uh, good sources. Manifest of tools. I'm going to hopefully put a lot of this stuff up on GitHub. So this is my GitHub, John T. Nelson. And this is my contact information. You can email me at john at computation.com. I have a computation com. Go back to the page before so they can pick, take a picture of the uh, URL. OK. I see them on the audience. Hopefully, John will be posting this session, too. Hopefully. GitHub.com slash John T. Nelson. And my contact info. Uh, email is important, john at computation.com. I think we have some time for Q&A if you have any questions. Uh, I think they want us to wrap it up, but uh, yeah, I'll take any questions. Let me mention this, which I didn't mention to begin with. Oculus Go goes for $199. It is absolutely the best low-priced standalone device. No and, tether. And that's the low price. The, and uh, if, but one caveat, if you're developing, buy the 249 one. It has uh, uh, 50 bucks more, and it uh, doubles the memory, which is what you need 64 for content. And you're going to be downloading different versions of your app, so you need the memory. Yep. So um, I'm sorry that was a little on the hasty slapdash side, but uh, you know what? The, the fun of it is uh, process of discovery. And uh, uh, all you have to do is go to, U to the Unity website, learn about Unity, then go to Oculus and learn about Oculus extensions that let you develop for Oculus. And, and there, there are a lot of resources on the web that uh, uh, detail this far better. Yeah, questions here. John, uh, to the right. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, the, the whole process is, is possible on the Mac? Absolutely. I did everything that you see on the Mac. Uh, the uh, tutorial for doing the sidebar is, is a mistake, that there is a problem with that, and you will have a little bit of problems with that. It took yeah. us a while to get working. But other than else, all the other tutorials are really good. Yeah. Guy in the hat. Uh, 
Um, one, one way to do that is to uh, keep a stationary view, uh, keep the view, your view stationary, and uh, uh, have a point of reference, like a spaceship or edges, like a HUD or something like that. We were trying to give you an example of some of the best ways of doing it. There are animated high motion ones for Oculus. Again, limited to market. There are tricks. You blur the edges so you don't see the edges going by. Um, I know a guy who does a soccer game where streaks go past you like you're going fast, like you're a cartoon out. Speed Looney lines. Games, that actually helps you not get nauseated. There was a demonstration app last year here where people were getting nauseated because they were flying over the surface real fast. So we changed the game so that you're flying over the map of the surface inside of a room. And the, the, the scroller was a scrolling piece of paper that you're flying over. Well, the rest of the room kept you stationary. So if you're, if you're thinking about something that's completely animated, high speed, with no edges or anything like that, you may want to rethink about how you present it. The, there's also some VR apps that, that manage to do it, um, like, um, what is it, Saber Beat? Beat Saber, yeah. Um, that, that has a lot of motion in it. Yeah, but that's motion coming at you. That's quite different that's from right. you moving, okay? That's right. So uh, your spaceship could have a point of reference as the spaceship and stationary and stuff coming, going by you. But well, here again, that, that sounds similar to Temple Run. Yeah. No, no, actually, a Beat Saber is a bit different. It's more like the game we were playing downstairs, the curvy one. Right. Uh, there, there's an indie game downstairs that's a little like Beat Saber. Um, can't remember the name of it, but it's groovy something. But it's, it's a lot of fun. Take a look at it. It's pretty good. It's a vibe yeah. game. By the way, if you're developing and you want to do multi-platforms, it's really a good idea to work with Oculus Go first because it's a lot easier to take your Oculus Go game and move it to the Vive than it is to take a Vive game and move it to the Oculus Go. Mm. Because if you designed it for the Vive, that meant you probably designed it for six degrees of freedom. And if you design it for three, you can move it up to six better than you go down the other way. That's, that's an, uh, an intriguing idea is a cross VR platform. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a Unity app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Yes. Can you speak up? I can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, could you speak up? I, I can't, I can't understand what you're saying. No, actually, that's part of the SDK itself. You, the, oh, the, actually, the, actually, it was. No, I, it was a separate package. Uh, it was oh, really? called Arc Teleport. I'm so used to that being standard. I thought it was part. I, of the I, I don't think it's in the standard package. Okay, there I may other, be wrong. There are other people who have put interfaces in there. For example, menuing systems. People have put complete menuing systems into the asset library. That's part of the o Oculus. Uh, part of the Oculus uh, st uh, sample framework and integration package. Sometimes is, I think that's the where the, I got the Arc Teleporter. Also, they have a menuing system, mm -hmm. which I didn't show you. Some of these games do, did have menuing in them, but we're mistaken if we're giving the idea the asset library is strictly artwork. It isn't. It's also code. It's also user interfaces. It's all sorts of things. Think prefabs, mm -hmm. uh, objects that have been completely constructed and consisting of scripts, materials, uh, 3D stuff. The only caveat I'll say is if you do assets from a lot of different things, sometimes you've got to go in and tweak them either to work together or to make them look like they're all from the same thing. Because if you have different artwork from three different people, sometimes the artwork's jarring. So you got to, sometimes you go in and you change the palette to make sure they all look similar. One more question. Yeah. Actually, HUD, HUD items are, are fairly acceptable, but keep them, keep them you know, to the periphery and, uh, and subtle. And it's usually best to have your HUD or, or other metaphors be uh, like physical metaphors, like, like a wristwatch or a you know, clock on the wall. Clock on the wall, you know, or something subtle in the scene. There is a whole level of interfaces where you click the controller in such a way and a status menu appears right there as a physical item and then you click it and it disappears so it pops up and not there. It's not part of the environment or will appear. It's more common in the Vive because it then appears and you can walk away from it. 
Um, so, but it's natural in game. Yes. I, I think I have to wrap this up there, kind of like holding up the sign that says "Get Get Out of Here." So thanks a lot for the for the uh, attending. Thank you, John. Um, please, um, one of the things I want to mention is this uh, track was created mostly from people who are members of the local um, DCVR meetup. So if you want to come join us, uh, there's two chapters, one in um, DC and one in Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia one is slightly more developer oriented. I'm in charge of it. We have meetings once a month. Our next meeting in February will be showing Magic Leap, which is a very rare item to get. Okay, have a good day. Thank you.